to really go verse by verse and and just speak on each verse and not just skip things and omit things. Uh, we like to really just expound on it. And, uh, you know, just a little bit of background info about Luke uh, 9, 18 through 22. In the previous weeks leading up to today, uh, we've been in the book of Luke, actually for majority of the year, I would say. And uh, we've seen the calling of the 12 disciples. Uh, Jesus has performed multiple healings and miracles. Actually, last week, Jared preached on uh, the feeding of the 5,000 with the loaves of bread and fish, which is probably one of the more well-known uh, stories there in the Bible. Um, something I found interesting is that the setting for this passage is a clear shift from what we were in last week. Last week, we had Jesus with 5,000 people feeding them, uh, but this, this week in our passage, uh, it's away from the crowd near uh, Bethsaida to an isolated place where Jesus was praying with the disciples. Uh, Matthew and Mark also record the conversation and is taking place in Caesarea Philippi, which is about 25 miles north of Galilee. So right there in Luke chapter 9, verse 18, uh, it says, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? And we're going to get to that question because that's kind of the meat of the message a little bit later. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to glaze over the very beginning of that verse, which is, which is Jesus praying. Uh, we, we oftentimes, when I was doing some research and listening to different pastors preach on this topic, a lot of them went straight to the question, but I think it's worth mentioning that Jesus prays, and, um, and he expects us to pray too. Uh, there's an emphasis on the importance of a prayer life. We can get busy uh, through all the things that we have going on in life. I know that it's been an extremely busy week for myself, and I'm sure that many of you can say the same thing. Um, but it's important not to neglect the quiet time with the Lord. Uh, Jesus was also very busy, despite being uh, in his own way, healing the sick, performing miracles, uh, doing his traveling ministry. Never neglected his time of prayer. And so I believe that uh, we should not do that either. Um, Although Christ had much public work to do, he found time to be alone and private for converse with himself, his father, and his disciples. When Christ was alone, he was praying, and it's good for us to improve our solitude for devotion, that when we're alone, we may not be alone, but may have the Father uh, with us. There are multiple examples in the Bible of Jesus praying. Um, He's seen to pray alone. Uh, one example is in Luke uh, chapter 5, verse 15, says, But now even more, the report about him went abroad. People knew who Jesus was. And great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So even uh, Jesus Christ would, would kind of escape the busyness of life at times. Uh, and pray, and I think that's important for us to remember. He would also pray in public. He would pray before meals. Uh, he would pray before important decisions. He would pray before healing. He would pray after healing. Uh, he would pray to do the Father's will, among many other things. And I think that that's important that we are always praying as well. Uh, Jesus demonstrates to us time and time again the importance of prayer throughout the Bible. He gives us the ultimate example throughout his life even to the end when he was being crucified on the cross in Luke 23, verse 34, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And I think that's very powerful that he would do that even in that moment. Um, of course, everyone's familiar with 1 Thessalonians, verse 16 through 18, that says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So there is power in prayer, and amen for that. Um, but my question for you, and you don't have to answer this out loud, but 
how is your prayer life? Um, if it's lacking, try to improve it. Do it little by little. Um, it's important. It's a foundational part of being a Christian. Uh, take the necessary steps and watch and see how many things may change for you. But I just wanted to mention that because I feel like it's oftentimes overlooked in this uh, portion of Scripture. Uh, so moving on to the second part of Luke 9, uh, verses 18 and 19, says, His disciples were with him, and they asked them, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. So we see that Jesus is asking, who do the crowd say I am? And that question is actually setting up a, another question, which we'll get to in a second, which is, who do you say I am? You know, a lot of times as Christians, uh, it's more important for us to know who the Lord says we are than who your neighbor says that you are, or your friend, or maybe even a family member, or just society as a whole. But uh, some said John the Baptist, some said Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets from long ago has come back to life. People who thought that Jesus was John the Baptist didn't know much about Jesus because he and John ministered at the same time. But both John and Elijah were national reformers who stood up to the corrupt rulers of the day. And I guess Jesus may have been seen in a similar light to some in that time. Um, perhaps in seeing Jesus as a John or an Elijah, the people hoped for a sort of political Messiah, one who will overthrow the corrupt powers uh, oppressing Israel. And, you know, when I read that and thought about that, it got me thinking that it's not that different today. You know, a lot of people look at politicians, whatever side of the aisle you're on, and they view them almost as a, a Messiah, a Savior. And... Um, I hate to tell you, but there's only one. And you can't put your faith in men alone, but in God alone. And so um, that was happening back then, and it still continues to happen today. Um, Elijah and John the Baptist were known uh, for their bold and uncompromising stand for the Word of God, however, even in the face of ruthless opposition. So there was cause for people to perhaps be confused about the identity of Jesus. Uh, John the Baptist, um, because Herod had executed him, um, many thought God had raised him from the dead and gave him supernatural power. So some people thought he was John the Baptist. Uh, Elijah stems from the assumption that he came to fulfill uh, Malachi uh, chapter 4, verse 5. However, Luke has already pointed out that that was fulfilled by John. Um, and then a risen prophet of old, for whatever reason, some suggested that uh, he may have been Jeremiah or other prophets from the Old Testament who had risen from the dead. But in each case, you will note that the belief was that he represented someone who had come back from the dead. And I, I do find that a little bit ironic because later, as we know as Christians, Jesus would end up doing that. Um, but they attributed his supernatural power to that favorable position. None of those answers truly identified him as the Messiah. Um, now, as Christians today, we have the ability to look back uh, into the past and see who Jesus was kind of from a historical perspective. Um, the disciples were living in present-day Jesus. They didn't have that ability. Um, and the book of Luke is fantastic. It gives us a good insight as to who Jesus truly was. Um, the matter of Jesus' identity is one that Luke has repeatedly emphasized. Uh, it was in the birth narrative in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, where the angels announced the birth of a Savior uh, who is Christ the Lord. Uh, John the Baptist himself denied that he was Christ and pointed people towards Jesus in Luke chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. Um, and John answered them all, and I'm reading from the scripture, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. 
he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And, you know, I just find that to be a very uh, vivid imagery there used to say he's not even uh, worthy to untie the straps of Jesus' sandals. And people were feeling John the Baptist as potential Messiah. And, and, and he's saying, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Um, even the demons knew who Jesus was, that he was the Holy One of God. And we saw in Luke chapter 4, verse 34, and the Son of God in chapter 4, verse 41. Uh, that's when Jesus was driving demons out of a man in a synagogue and healed uh, many that had demons. And the demons literally said, you are the Son of God. And then, of course, the, the theme start resurfaced again when Jesus forgave the paralytic sins and the scribes and Pharisees responded, Who is this man that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? In chapter 5, verse 21 of Luke, even when Jesus stilled the storm, um, and I, I believe that may have been, Claude, was that you? Did you do that one? Jesus still in the storm? Yeah, I think you were the one that preached that one. Uh, and they, they said, um, who is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? Herod uh, raises the question when he hears of the miracles taking place. Who is this man about whom I, I hear such things? Of course, Herod had beheaded John, so he knew that the probability of that being John was zero. Uh, he had beheaded him unless it was someone else. So we have all these clues and evidence as to who Jesus really is. The disciples did not have that at that time. We do, and that's a blessing that we do. But then Jesus asked the question, Now, what, but what about you? He asked there in verse 20. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, God's Messiah. The Christ of God. Peter knows Jesus. He'd spent more time with Jesus than the average Joe of the day. He was a disciple. He was following Jesus quite a bit. And this was a huge statement given the circumstances surrounding the time and the location that this conversation took place. Um, I guess it's archaeologists. I don't know. I'm not a scientist guy, but archaeologists or excavators uh, from that region revealed that numerous inscriptions and shrines dedicated to various gods and uh, in the Roman period in this area where this conversation was taking place. This image shows that there was three temples found in Caesarea Philippi uh, with inscriptions to August, Zeus, and Pan, and the dancing goat. So we're seeing all these false idols uh, in this region. Its prior name, Panaeus, reflected the prominent worship of Pan, a god of the underworld. The region also included prominent temples dedicated for emperor worship. So that's important because, in other words, the region was a place where many false idols had been worshipped throughout history. And it made it a fitting location for Jesus to ask the disciples about his own identity. Who do you say I am? And Peter's answer was recorded in Matthew 16, verse 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That would have served as a, a not-so-subtle uh, refutation of the region's reputation for that idolatry. It's just waving caution, no, caution to the wind. Uh, he's saying that you are God's Messiah, and he's saying that among all of these pagan images that are around him. And that's bold, and I think that we're, uh, as Christians... Required to be bold for our faith as well. He knows that Jesus is the Christ of God, God's Messiah, the Messiah from the heart of God, not the Messiah from the desire of man. And um, that's important to talk about because when we talk about the desire of man, we all have desires, we all have wishes, things that we want to happen in our own lives. Hopefully those things align with the will of God in our lives, but they don't always um, and we have to guard against that because we are flesh and we have to guard against that daily. We live in a time in history where people like to follow their, and I'm going to do air quotes here, their own truth. Their own truth. That's what they like to follow. You will see it plastered everywhere these days. Um, and 
That is very subjective. My truth might not be the same as your truth. My truth may change from day to day depending on how I feel. The truth is not subjective. The, the true truth is not subjective. God's truth is objective. So let's talk about the question, who do you say I am? I want you to imagine that maybe you were a disciple, you were with Jesus, and Jesus was asking you this question. Who do you say I am in 2024? How would you answer that? Well, I want to talk about a, a few points of interest about that question in particular. The first thing I'd like to talk about is that the answer to that question, who do you say I am, is objective. It's not Jesus, however you perceive him to be. Jesus didn't say, oh, great answer, Peter. Do any of the rest of you have different thoughts? Jesus, uh, Peter gave the correct answer, and that, there was nothing that needed to be added to that. There was nothing that needed to be said after that. He didn't ask for differing opinions. Some say today, for me, Jesus is always accepting and loving. You'll hear that a lot from people today. And Jesus can be accepting and he can be loving. Those are attributes of God, but... You can't just say that's his only attributes. How you feel about Jesus doesn't change who he is. There's one single correct answer to the question, and it's not based on your feelings of the day or your personal opinions, but in an objective, revealed truth. Now, we need to view the spiritual th truth in terms of verifiable history centered in historical Jesus of Nazareth whose teachings and miracles and death and bodily resurrection are reported in the New Testament by eyewitnesses. So let's look and see who the Bible says Jesus is because he left us his word and so we don't have to wonder, we don't have to have questions. And we'll never fully know Jesus. We're always continuing to get him to know him better, hopefully, in our lives. But a few things that the Bible says, and I ha if you want to see me after the service, I can give you the specific scriptures. I'm asking you to trust me on this. But um, who does the Bible say Jesus is? Well, he's stated to be an advocate, an apostle, a shepherd and bishop, a brother, Christ, counselor, Deliverer, friend, everlasting father, head of the church, high priest, holy one of God, judge, king, light of the world, master, mediator, messiah, prince of peace, physician, sacrifice, salvation, son of righteousness, teacher, the truth, and wonderful. Those are just some of the things that the Bible says he is. I didn't want to just keep going and going and going, but I could. Because there's a lot that the Bible says about who Jesus is. Ultimately, it's important to know that Jesus is the Son of God. In Luke 22, uh, verse 70, Jesus said that himself to a council of elders soon before his crucifixion. It says in Luke twenty two seventy. Then they all said, Are you the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. There's no gray area there. It's 100%. Someone asked him a question directly, and he answered it directly. We know that Jesus lived a sinless life. We know that Jesus is the only way to God. It says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. We know that Jesus foresaw his own death and his resurrection. We know that Jesus said he would return from death and that he would conquer death, which he did. We're able to see that with history. The disciples had to have faith in that. It's important that the first thing we recognize about the question, who do you say Jesus is, is that it has 
one correct answer and many incorrect or partial answers. Uh, and it's not a matter of your personal opinion or your preference where any answer is as good as the next. It's a matter of God's truth revealed in his word. The second thing I want us to see is the question, who do you say I am, is going to be divisive. It's going to be divisive. Now, none of us really like confrontation or division. If you do, I'll pray for you because it's not a good thing to... Some of you guys like the drama and we shouldn't, but we all prefer peace and unity, truly. And if you go by your emotions, you will fall into some serious... uh, Error and defection from God's revealed truth. Your emotions are, are changing constantly, depending on the day. And, you know, if you read your New Testament, it gives several warnings uh, against false teachers and false doctrines. And uh, one of those examples is in Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 2 through 4. And I'll just read this to you. It says, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Church family, I think that time is today. I think people are not wanting true church doctrine. They're wanting whatever feels good for them. It goes on to say, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And you're seeing that a lot, even in the church today. Have you ever thought about how difficult it must have been for those disciples at the time to commit themselves to Jesus as the Christ, you know, for centuries Jews were, were waiting on a Messiah to come and there'd be one that would come and they think, oh, we, we think that's the one and they, they would get their hopes up, but it would not be. Sometimes prophets would come on the scene raising those hopes and they would die and people just kept waiting and waiting. And then suddenly a young carpenter from Nazareth began preaching, performing miracles. Could he be the one? He didn't fit the narrative of what a Messiah would be like to, in their eyes, but The disciples committed themselves to Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. Remember, they didn't have the 1,900 years of church history to confirm their faith as we do, or 1,900 plus, I should say. They were the first ones to say, this is the one. And they had to say it in the face of public opinion that didn't agree with them. They were ostracized. The disciples had to stand against the currents of society, and as Christians today, you will have to do the same. We're fortunate to live in a place where we're not necessarily physically persecuted to the extent that maybe they are in different places in the world, but that day could come. We are persecuted in our own ways. Um, A lot of times we're discriminated against because of our beliefs whether it's in the workforce or maybe in personal relationships and things of that nature. But, you know, these disciples, they were standing against the Roman government at the time, and the Roman government didn't care necessarily that they were Christians that worshipped Jesus as long as they affirmed that Caesar was Lord too. Um, And they would say, no, but Jesus is the only Lord And that narrow view cost many of them their lives. Does this sound similar to our society today? You know, you can can be a Christian, you can be religious, but just keep it in your church building. Don't bring it to me. Don't bring it out to the public. And that is a direct opposite of what Jesus says in the, the Bible says in the Great Commission, which is therefore go and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of age. We're required to do those things. And that doesn't mean just the people in the church. That means outside of the church too. 
Um, if you take a stand like the disciples did in proclaiming that Jesus was the only way to God, you will have to go against the culture of the day. People don't mind if you have your own personal beliefs in Jesus, but don't contend that he's the only way. That's what society would tell you. Are you willing to stand on God's truth, even if it divides you from others, whether that's family, coworkers, friends? Maybe it might make your life a little more difficult. It was for the disciples, and it will be for us as well. Secondly, uh, you may have to go against even the own Christian crowd of our day. Many who call themselves Christians have ideas about Jesus, uh, which may fall short of fully affirming him as Lord in Christ. Some see Jesus as an all-tolerant, loving one who never speaks against anyone's sin. That is not true. He does speak against sin. They seek to get their own denominations and to affirm the sins such as homosexuality or abortion. And others use Jesus to endorse their worldly or political views. Others mix in Jesus with some of their own ideas and create a God in their own image. We see that quite a bit. You know, you have to stand against these popular views of Jesus and confess him truly as the Lord and Christ. And if you know who Jesus truly is, you need to be telling people who he truly is. If you have trouble, like I do sometimes, of coming up with the words, then use your Bible. The Bible is a great resource. So Pastor Mark Tercio really likes to reference this study. It was performed by Lifeway Research, uh, and his study was called Ligonier State of Theology, and it was performed in 2022. And I'm going to read a few statistics here for you, and they are alarming. Um, and they should provoke a sense of urgency within you as a Christian. Um, But they did a study, and they found that 59% of Americans, and these are just Americans in general, not professed Christians or evangelicals, but 59% of Americans believe that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion, and it's not about objective truth. And I guess, you know, that is to be expected from the lost and non-evangelical people who have not experienced the, you know, Jesus in their own lives. On the other hand, 56% of evangelicals, so that we're talking professing Christians of faith, well, I'm not going to judge them, but they claim, 56% of them disagree with that thought, and they, they say that Religious belief is objective truth, and I agree with that 56%. But the more alarming number in that is the other 44%. 44% of evangelical Americans believe it's a personal opinion. Wow. Those are people in our church. Well, hopefully not this church, but... thing for us. In addition, that study found that 12% of evangelical Americans, and this is the most alarming one, do not believe that Jesus' death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of their sins. These are people in the church, 12%. I mean, I don't know what we got in here, roughly 30 people. That would be like three of you don't believe that Jesus was the sacrifice that we needed for our sins. That is alarming. These are people in the churches today. You know, in verse 21 of our passage, it says, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone, and he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed, and on the third day, raised to life. Now, you may wonder, as I did, 
perhaps why did Jesus not or tell them not to tell anybody? And it's possible it's because of, at that point, they, even the disciples may have had a false conception of what a Messiah was. Peter knew. He said, you are the Messiah of God. But when Jesus said, don't tell anybody, the disciples themselves did not fully understand because the Jewish concept of the day of a Messiah coming was establishing a, the kingdom and to overthrow the kingdoms of the world. As I mentioned previously, more of a political Messiah type. Jesus knew his mission needed to be accomplished not by establishing his throne in Jerusalem and overthrowing the Roman powers, but by bringing the world into submission. But his, but, uh, his kingdom was to be established by him hanging on the cross. The question, who do you say I am, is divisive. We've seen that it's divisive within our society. We've seen it can be divisive even within our own uh, churches. And it can also be divisive with religious leaders. It was in the day of uh, when this was written, another group of disciples had to oppose the Jewish religious leaders there in... uh, Chapter 9, verse 22, the disciples excuse me, were not uh, formal, formally educated in the Hebrew Scriptures like some of the other leaders were at that time. They were just fishermen, common men. So they had to go against the judgment of people who were a little more educated than them, people who were more respected in society. Um, you know, you'll often have to join the disciples in pitting your view of Jesus against the religious scholars of our day. Even some who call themselves evangelicals deny the trustworthy nature of all the scripture. Have you ever been to a church where you're visiting maybe and you just hear something that makes you think twice? It says, wait, what, what did he just say? He's talking about the stars in astrology? What? The only thing that we need to be talking about from this pulpit is things that pertain to the Word of God and the Word of God. That's it. When I was doing my research about false teachers and false doctrines, I came across something called the Jesus Seminar. Some of you may be familiar with it. It was started in 1985 by a man by the name of Robert Funk. And when I heard Jesus Seminar, I'm probably thinking, well, it's a terrible name for what they were actually doing, but you would think, that's awesome. I want to go to a Jesus Seminar. I'm a Christian. I'm on fire for the Lord. These men are not what they claim to be. The Jesus Seminar, initially, the goal was to review each of the sayings and deeds attributed to Jesus in the Gospels, which I can get behind studying that. But what they wanted to do was study it and determine which of them were authentic, which ones were real. The Jesus Seminar was and still is comprised almost entirely of individuals who deny the inspiration, authority, and inerrancy of the Bible. So what they would do is they would debate an item on their agenda, and scholars would vote scholars would vote using colored beads to indicate the degree of authenticity of the words and deeds attributed to Jesus in the Gospels. They would drop colored beads into the box, and that soon became the trademark for the Jesus Seminar. Among the findings that they had was that, in their judgment, 18% of the sayings and 16% of the deeds attributed to Jesus in the gospel are authentic. Only 18% are authentic, according to them, for his words, and 16% for his deeds. These are, quote-unquote, religious leaders of the day. They're false leaders. They're false teachers. As a Christian, you need to be vigilant. Do research. Pray on it. 
If you just take what people say blindly, you could fall into this. These religious leaders are false teachers, and it's something we need to combat as Christians. You know, for them to do this is ridiculous. It's their opinion. I choose to submit to uh, chapter two, or sorry, Second Timothy chapter three, verses uh, sixteen and seventeen, which says, "All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching." for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. I submit to that, not what a few guys at the Jesus Seminar would say. Second Peter verse 1, verse 20 and 21 also says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along, by the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is trustworthy. I can't even trust myself sometimes. Why would I trust a group of men when I have God's Word in front of me? The third thing I want us to see, we, we, we've said that you know it's, it's divisive, but the question, who do you say I am, has deepening levels of understanding. Peter's answer, the Christ of God, is certainly correct. However, we know that Peter may have had a different conception of what that meant than what Jesus did. You know, we can read Matthew's account of the same event to kind of broaden our knowledge. If you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and turn to Matthew um, chapter 16, verse 20 through 23. This is Matthew's account of the same passage that we are reading from today, and it does give us a little bit more knowledge and background information here. Matthew 16, verses 20 through 23. Once again, it's the same account, just from Matthew. It sounds very similar at the beginning, but there's some added meat at the end there that we should take note of. Uh, so Matthew 16, verses, starting in verse 20, Then he strictly charged all the disciples not to tell anyone that he was Christ. For that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So that's what we just read. Matthew's account adds in verse 22, And Peter took him aside And began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And then Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Talked about the desire of man, the desire for maybe a political messiah. Peter understands who Jesus is, but he doesn't fully understand. He's starting to deepen his understanding of who Jesus is. Peter meant, you're the Christ of God. You're here to rule on earth and almighty power and in, in regard to his first coming, because Jesus will do that eventually, but in his first coming, the more correct answer was, you are the one anointed by God to be crucified as our sin bearer and raised from the dead by the power of God. Jesus had to fulfill Isaiah 53 and other scriptures which would point to Messiah bearing the sins of his people before he would reign on David's throne. Peter was correct, but he needed to come to a deeper level of correct understanding. You know, one of the beautiful things about the Christian life is that you grow into deeper and deeper levels of understanding about the infinite, unfathomable, sovereign person of Jesus Christ. I hope you do. It's not hard to do it. Pray. We talked about that earlier. Be in your word. Spend time with the Lord. Do you know him as your savior? If you do, that's great. That's a start. But why would you stop there? There's so much more. Do you want more of him? You know, Jesus tells us how we can know more of him. In John chapter 14, verse 21, 
It says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. If you know your Bible, that's great. If you try to live like Jesus wants us to live, you'll draw nearer to him. You'll follow his commandments. And he will disclose more of himself to you. Can't give a baby steak. You have to be prepared for that. You have to build up to that. Jesus will give you what you need when you need it. He'll let you know who he is. Jesus promises to reveal more of himself to those who obey him. So begin with knowing Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one of God, the Savior. But go on and discover all that he says and is as the sovereign Lord of the universe. You know, the joy of the Christian life is growing to know the Lord more intimately. Now, one of the last things I want to talk about that question, who do you say I am, is the question requires a personal response of faith and obedience. Who do you say I am? Well, if you say that Jesus is your Savior, well, then we must acknowledge our sins that separate us from God. Lots of people will acknowledge Jesus as Savior, but they'll forget about what they need saving from. <laughs> you know, we need to know that. We know that what Jesus said to the disciples was not exactly what they wanted to expect to, expected to hear or wanted to hear even. Their idea of Christ may have been the political Messiah, but they were thinking of the power and dominion, not of the suffering and the rejection and the death. But Jesus wasn't sent by the Father to make everyone happy so that they could go on and live self-centered lives and with a little bit of God's help. And, you know, he came to deal with the fundamental problem of the human race, and that is sin. You know, the essence of sin is our stubborn self-will that says, I'll run my own life, God. Just help me feel good when I need you. You've seen it in movies, I'm sure, maybe even in your own life, or you've seen someone do it. Oh, God, if you just get me out of this situation, I will serve you. Bartering with the Lord. Mm. The cross, where the Lord of glory took the penalty for what we deserved, was the only divine solution for our sin problem. You can't be a good enough person to be forgiven of your sins. The only way is through his sacrifice. If you haven't come as a sinner to the crucified Christ and trusted him on God's provision for your sin, then you have not responded correctly to Jesus' crucial question, who do you say I am? You know, if Jesus was like us, he would probably try to weasel his way out of that sacrifice for Jesus to have avoided the cross would have been for him to seek his own selfish interests and thank the Lord that he did not do that. Satan would have triumphed had he done that. That's why he said in verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer. He came to glorify his Father by being obedient even to death on a cross. The must suffer, must, was the necessity of obedience to the Father's will above all else. It shows that Jesus' death was a necessary and an inevitable part of the divine plan. Understanding that Jesus is the Christ of the cross means that those who follow him must walk in the way of the cross, which means trusting and obeying in him, even when it may not feel good in the moment. So I'm going to close with this question. How do you respond to that question? Who do you say I am? Do you act in obedience? If you say that he is, who the Bible says he is, do you trust the Lord to 
take control in your own life, could be in your relationships, could be in your career, it could be in your friendships, it could be in your finances. Do you trust the Lord to take control of your life? I'm going to leave you with this. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make, your straight, will make straight your paths. We don't need to trust in our own understanding. We need to trust in the Lord. Let us pray.